Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, discussion event, our virtual discussion event uh, entitled uh, Policy Potpourri, a panel on domestic political events and issues. Um, this is a virtual panel discussion uh, that's being hosted by the Department of Political Science and the School of Education and Behavioral Sciences. We're being also co-sponsored by the MGA Political Science Student Organization and the uh, Alpha Mu Zeta chapter of Pi Sigma Alpha, which is the National Honorary Society for uh, Political Science Students. Um, so before we get started, uh, we will uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, our department and its programs and things like that. I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the structure of the event, um, our discussion topics, and uh, go from there. So um, as far as our programs go, um, our department offers uh, two bachelor's degree programs, uh, political science and interdisciplinary studies. So if you're not familiar with those programs, please uh, uh, feel free to learn a little bit more about those. Um, we also are part of a uh, our new doctrine in uh, public safety that's been started with our friends over in the uh, Department of Psychology and Criminal Justice. Uh, that'll be starting in January with our first cohort. Uh, we also offer undergraduate minors, um, so if you're majoring in something else, if you're majoring in something like business or nursing or education or uh, psychology or criminal justice or any of a myriad of other things, um, aviation, uh, you can uh, add a minor to your bachelor's degree. Um, so if you want to study another area, um, and we offer several of those, including political science, uh, African and African diaspora studies. If you're interested in that subject in particular, uh, Dr. Caverly will actually be teaching the uh, uh, introductory course in that area in the spring. So that's something you might want to sign up for if you're interested in that um, in that minor. Uh, we also offer minors in uh, environmental policy studies, um, global studies, uh, and uh, pre-law. So if you're interested in law school or um, paralegal work, things like that, pre-law is a minor for that. And finally, we also are a participant in the University System of Georgia's uh, Certificate in European Union Studies, which is a program that involves uh, college faculty from um, about eight uh, different uh, universities and colleges across the University System of Georgia. Um, so uh, let's introduce our panelists for today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Hall, who's an associate professor of political science. Uh, he's been here at Middle Georgia State University since 2015. His doctorate in public policy administration is from Auburn University, um, which uh, just suffered a horrendous defeat at the hands of Ole Miss. Roll time. Um, also, um, uh, we have uh, Dr. Matthew Caverly. Uh, lecturer of political science who has been here at Middle Georgia State since 2016. Uh, his doctorate is in political science and uh, his PhD is from the University of Florida um, in Gainesville. And uh, finally, I'm your uh, illustrious moderator, um, uh, Dr. Christopher Lawrence. I'm the professor uh, or a professor and the chair of the Department of Political Science. I've been here since uh, 2012. And my PhD in political science is from the University of Mississippi, which, of course, is the school that beat Auburn uh, over the weekend. Um, I'm only rubbing this in because I know that John is not actually an Auburn fan. So um, in any event, um, speaking of our event, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with a few topics that the panelists have discussed uh, beforehand. Uh, we will, though, uh, entertain. We actually want your questions as well. So if you have questions about uh, topics you'd like us to discuss or if you want us to elaborate on something or feel free uh, to uh, you know, have those subjects as well, uh, you can uh, add uh, your uh, thoughts or your uh, questions in the chat window. And we will try to address those in the uh, order that we receive them. Uh, we do have a couple of um, ground rules there. Uh, first, that uh, while you're welcome to ask and contribute multiple things, um, we do prioritize answering one question per person if possible. So, um, so if you add, you know, if, if there aren't a lot of questions and you have two or three questions, that's fine. But, um, but sometimes we do have you know situations where we have quite a lot of questions. And, um, you know, we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask a question if possible. Um, so we will prioritize giving each of you a question uh, before 
uh, going and asking or using additional questions from the audience. Um, also, please be courteous and civil to each other in the chat window. Um, this has not historically been a problem in our chats before, and I hope this is not the day that it becomes a problem. But if it does, um, that will be nipped in the bud just to make you aware, you know, the expectations of uh, all of our community members are for uh, civility and uh, politeness towards each other, particularly, um, you know, on on subjects that may not necessarily be um, uh, ones on which we all agree. Um, and so. Um, and particularly, you know, don't don't uh, engage in you know personal criticisms of other people in particular um, as sort of a ground rule there. Um, so as far as our uh, topics are concerned, some of the ones we're going to talk about, although we did promise a domestic uh, policy and events uh, topic, uh, we have had one uh, important international event emerge over the last couple of weeks. I think it is worth uh, uh, some discussion has had some impact on domestic politics as well and uh, on our domestic situation, although certainly it's not um solely an American issue uh, or even close to uh, an Amer a uh, solely American issue. But nonetheless, there have been some repercussions in America. And so we do want to talk a little bit about the uh, conflict that's going on uh, between uh, Israel and Hamas and Gaza uh, a little bit. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about, uh, hopefully, uh, the uh, Speaker of the House interregnum. Um, so if you're not familiar with that, we'll certainly get into that subject. Um, in a moment. Um, and we also want to talk a lot about state politics because we haven't talked a lot about state and local politics uh, this semester. And so uh, we're going to try to address some things like the state budget surplus. Um, there's a, a big surplus in our state budget and uh, there are uh, debates and discussions about what's going to be done with that money. Um, and I think we'll have some fruitful discussion about that. Uh, also, uh, uh, Medicaid expansion, uh, speaking of things that we could be spending the surplus on, um, we may talk a little bit about that as an example, but also uh, there has been a um, uh, some uh, expansion of Medicaid, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that's been going. Uh, we're going to talk about something called a SPLOST. If you've never heard of a SPLOST, we'll talk about SPLOST until your ears bleed. Um, also, uh, some controversies have been arising with the Fulton County Jail over the last few months. Uh, there's been a, uh, a large number of inmate fatalities um, over the last few months at the Fulton County Jail in particular. Um, and uh, what is being done to address that. And then last but not least, uh, as I've imagined, we put it on the slide, Rico Suave, um, mm -hmm. which is a dated reference that probably nobody in the audience uh, other than us old fogey professors will get. Um, but, uh, you know, that um, as some of you may know, uh, there is a uh, ongoing uh, prosecution of uh, Donald Trump and various co-conspirators on charges related to their attempts uh, to try to get uh, the state government to um, uh, change the results of the 2020 election in favor of Donald Trump. Um, and this is called the RICO case. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, if uh, if time permits and our panel is interested. So those are kind of our topics. Um, so I will uh, make this go away so you can look at us instead. I don't know if that's a plus or a minus. Um, and uh, let's see, um, without further ado, we'll go on ahead and uh, get with our uh, first question here. So you know, it has a long preamble, so I will, uh, I will begin the question. Um, so um, although this is certainly primarily an international political issue, the attacks on Israeli civilians by the Palestinian militant group Hamas and Israel's response to the Gaza Strip have had effects on Americans and American politics too, including the murder of a, a Palestinian immigrant child, uh, more recently the murder of a, a Jewish uh, community leader in um, Detroit, um, and violence and threats against both Jewish and Muslim Americans. There are also American citizens being held hostage in Gaza by Hamas. I think there are about 10 or so, uh, last estimate. Um, there are Americans trying to get uh, out of the region. Um, there are Palestinian Americans. So Americans um, are American citizens that are also Palestinian. They're trapped in Gaza. Um, so lots of Americans are affected by this, either directly or indirectly. What role is the United States playing in this conflict? 
And how has American domestic politics been impacted by this uh, conflict, which as of today is only just over two weeks old, uh, even though it probably feels like a lot longer? Um, I can, I'll jump in on this. Dr. Caverly may be more um, knowledgeable on this, having served in the military, uh, but I'll give it my best shot. I want to give a quick little uh, aside. Earlier when introducing the topics, I started to chuckle and laugh uh, when I saw Rico dot 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 suave. It occurs to me that Dr. Lawrence was mentioning the deaths in Fulton County jails when I did that. So please know that I was not chuckling at that. I was laughing at the suave. Having said that, uh, the crisis in Israel, uh, as we're all following, uh, we've been covering this uh, in class with uh, several of uh, my students asking questions about it. We will look at this from a domestic policy standpoint in terms of U.S. involvement. Uh, the key is to understand that U.S. involvement in the Israeli-Gaza war uh, does not involve any uh, projections for U.S. direct military involvement. We are not going into Gaza. Uh, having said that, we are redeploying uh, naval forces uh, to the area. We have deployed one aircraft carrier group, the Ford, that is our most recent state-of-the-art 14 to 15 billion dollar uh, aircraft carrier. Uh, we are also deploying the Eisenhower. So we have two aircraft carrier groups that are either there or on the way there. That is an enormous amount of military firepower. Uh, we also uh, have additional amphibious uh, units that are being deployed, which uh, also include about 2,500 combat Marines. Uh, they will be in the area along with the aircraft carriers predominantly uh, to encourage all other groups, all outside actors uh, that are thinking about taking advantage of the war in Israel and Gaza to not do so. Uh, the prospect of directly engaging U.S. aircraft carriers is something that no nation state, no terror group necessarily would want to do because the odds of winning are so dramatically small. Uh, so first and foremost, we are projecting force into the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, predominantly to show the world that the United States is there and any other actors who wanna get involved need to change their mind and not get involved. Uh, having said that, we are furthering US aid uh, to Israel. We have always given aid to Israel since the late 1940s. Uh, the most recent aid package in 2022 was a little bit over $3 billion. Uh, the Biden administration has recently asked for a little over $10 billion in aid, predominantly to help the Israelis uh, resupply, uh, particularly regarding the Iron Dome um, anti-missile uh, defense system that they have been using extensively, both in the southwest, in Gaza, and sporadically in the north um, with Hezbollah in Lebanon. We could talk about them more later, also potentially launching uh, rockets into Israel. Uh, we are looking at uh, sending in additional Patriot missile systems, which is another form of anti-missile uh, defense. And strangely enough, I actually saw this today when looking at most the most recent uh, Biden administration uh, efforts to assist Israel. We're looking at sending in the THAAD uh, anti-missile system, which is something that can shoot down ballistic missiles that are coming in from outer space. I'm not entirely sure who that would be for other than Iran. Uh, but I was actually surprised to see that THAAD might be going in there. Um, we have an extraordinary amount of military capability in the area, um, not just in the Eastern Mediterranean, but we also have military forces in the Red Sea. Uh, in the recent days, uh, missiles have been fired from Iranian-supported Houthi rebels in Yemen uh, that were shot down uh, by Arleigh Burke-class destroyers in the Red Sea. Uh, they shot down, I believe, four missiles and up to a dozen uh, drones that were sent from Yemen. Not entirely sure exactly where those were going, but they were sent in the general direction of an Arleigh Burke destroyer. So they're going to knock those out of the sky every time. In general, again, just to kind of summarize, because I could keep talking about this forever and I have to make myself stop. So far, the U.S. is doing a couple of things. We are one, without question, showing the world, uh, domestic and foreign audiences, that we support the Israelis, uh, that we reject the terrorist government of Hamas and the surprise attack from over two weeks ago on a uh, Jewish holiday, which was also coinciding with, I believe, the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War in 1973. We have, without equivocation, shown the world that we support the Israelis. Um, we are also 
not, and I can't repeat this enough, not interested in getting militarily involved with any actual boots on the ground in Gaza. Now, there might be an exception because we do have U.S. special forces that are, from everything I've seen, almost certainly in Israel, and we have a few thousand combat Marines that are going to be off the coast soon, if not already, they could very easily be used to help rescue uh, the U.S. hostages, not to mention other hostages, but particular U.S. hostages. If we are able to locate uh, areas where U.S. hostages are being held, then I assure you we will have special forces on the ground to go and get them. But again, in general, we're there to help support the Israelis, and we have zero interest in putting boots on the ground in a large way, and we're trying to encourage all other actors to stay out while continuously uh, consulting with the Israelis uh, in their efforts at eradicating Hamas. Because for decades, uh, the Israeli foreign policy toward the internationally recognized terrorist group Hamas, which won elections in 2006, or took a, they took office in 2007 after the Israelis pulled out of Gaza in 2005. Um, we are overwhelmingly supportive of the Israeli efforts to eradicate them. U.S. excuse me, Israeli foreign policy toward Hamas has changed forever. They are no longer going to coexist with Hamas, and we are there to help them. With that, I think that's just as good a spot as any for me to stop talking and uh, turn things over uh, to Dr. Caverly, who can fill in the multiple blanks that I left. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Hall. Um, well, I, I think I will. Uh, I, I think I will focus my comments uh, um, away from the uh, uh, too much of the security uh, dilemma aspect of this. I think that's been covered pretty well. Um, the uh, politically, uh, well, one for starters, in terms of, of foreign aid, it, Israel is. Um, historically the number one recipient of American foreign aid uh, and has been now for decades. Uh, um, and in particular regarding the um, uh, the Arab, various Arab-Israeli conflicts of which if I counted, I've tried to count them up my head. I, I think this is the eighth one. I might be off on that. We might already be on the ninth one. Uh, anyway, um, while the United States um, did not overly uh, help the Israelis um, in the first two, uh, 48 and 56, but since the Six Day War in 1967, the United States has been the number one uh, security supporter of Israel. Before that, it was the British and the French. Um, but having said that, in terms of, uh, of domestic politics, uh, some people often are, well, why is that the case? Well, um, there's a number of groups that, that uh, are relatively bipartisan in, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, American-Israeli relations, which, by the way, puts us in a bad position with American-Arab relations, Palestinian and otherwise. Uh, so, the um, um, within the Democratic Party, um, the uh, the Jewish vote. Uh, now, American Jews are, are a very small group. However, I do want to say this: the number one. A lot of people make this mistake. They think that uh, most uh, people of Jewish extraction are Israelis. That's not actually true. Most of them are Americans. Um, uh, America is the number one Jewish country in the world. But uh, uh, Jews are a small minority in America. But uh, American politics uh, reflects really two things, the organized and the resourced. And um, uh, the American Jewish community is uh, very organized, very resourced. Uh, and they are a key component of America's Democratic Party. Uh, and they have a very strong um, um, interest group uh, orientation. Their, their, their group is called APAC, and um, and they are power hitters in American elections and in governing. They they uh, they're very successful uh, lobby groups. APAC stands for American Israeli Political Action Commi uh, Committee. Well, on top of that, in America's Republican Party. Um, Again, another group uh, that is not just organized and resourced, but also has great masses is big, 
uh, is the, uh, uh, the white evangelical community. And the white Protestant evangelical community uh, has very pro-Israeli uh, leanings, uh, largely because of, uh, of uh, biblical connections um, to the Holy Land and, and you know, uh, the fundamentalist read, the, the strict constructors, if you will, originalist read of the Bible where the, uh, you know, where it says that you, you, if you support Israel, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, you will you will receive the blessings of God, and you'll be in an honored country. And if you don't, you're you're going to get the ire of God, the wrath of God, all that good stuff. Uh, so, what you have, while it is true that in the Dem America's Democratic Party, there is a pro-Palestinian faction, they are also organized, uh, and they have an interest. They have a powerful interest group, sort of powerful. But they're not powerful compared to what uh, uh, the Israeli community uh, has in American politics. So it's an asymmetric um, balance between the two uh, that definitely favors uh, 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 the Jewish community or the Israeli community writ large at the expense of all the Arabs, including the Palestinians. Um, while the Democrats have this faction of pro-Palestinians, they've actually been in the news a little bit. Uh, uh, Tlaib's, uh, uh, she's a representative from uh, Michigan, and she has a, a strong Arab uh, community that she represents, and she herself is Palestinian. And uh, she's made some speeches. She joined the squad, the so-called squad, her and Omar and a few of the others that, are, that have been out uh, uh, talking on behalf of the Palestinians. But I can, I can want to tell everybody that that is a, a minority position for good, bad, or indifferent reasons. That's a minority position in American politics. Even in the Democratic Party, while the Palestinians are there, um, they are, if you will, they, they, uh, they punch far below uh, uh, the, the power that, the, that uh, American Jews have. Uh, and in the Republican Party, um, there's no real just significant Palestinian or even Arab um, presence whatsoever. Uh, and, and in conservative interest groups, the same thing. So what you have is you have a, a, an overall uh, Israeli dominated Republican party and an overall asymmetrically balanced in favor of Israeli politics, Democratic party. And so from those domestic considerations, it's not that surprising that America right now is, 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 if you will, America is funding the war. Uh, so, um, and um, we'll probably continue doing that. Uh, the other thing that I, I would say on, on these matters, and then I, I think we need to probably move on or something here, but, uh, but um, when you look at um, American politics, um, one of the great difficulties, though, that we're going to have, remember I said that America is the number one uh, funder of, of uh, Israel. But it is also true that in the current foreign aid campaign for the Palestinians, which is being run through the UN, America is also the number one contributor to that. So this is an interesting uh, uh, play out. Now, that's going to play out more in, in, in diplomatic affairs. But you know, that's lies somewhat behind the Biden administration is, is asking the Israels to the Israelis to to hold back a little bit on their ground incursion, uh, their ground invasion. Because of course that what 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 Prime Minister Netanyahu has said is that he wants essentially to destroy Hamas as a as a, not just as a military entity, but as a political entity. And to to force the Palestinians to rebuild from the ground up. In, in, a, in a way maybe that would be more uh, uh, less um, less of a risk to um, the Israelis. But if you notice, the Biden administration is trying to get the, um, the Israelis to hold back a little bit on that. And I think some of that is that's because of the humanitarian issues that's going on in the, so if you will, you have to understand something about the Israeli way of war. The Israeli way of war is they conduct total war. Uh, they are they're absolutists. Uh, so they uh, um, 
in America, we have not practiced that form of warfare since the Second World War. In America, we've got very used to fighting limited wars with limited means for limited ends. And sometimes that led to success and sometimes not so. But for the Israelis, they go all in. Uh, and if Netanyahu is serious, and I think he's very serious, he's going to try and cr absolutely crush the Palestinians. But in that process, that is going to produce a tremendous humanitarian crisis. And the risk of that, I'll just, and then I'll leave this alone, but the risk of that is that if there's anything that's going to spread this thing outside of Palestine, it might be that. Uh, the Egyptians have, and, the, and the Iranians uh, have already signaled that they, um, uh, they might get involved. Uh, and that would be a scary thing. If, if this thing blew up in a regional war, uh, Professor Hall warned about the, the possibility of, of America, that America does not want to put significant numbers of boots on the ground. I agree with that completely. But one of the unfortunate things about the fog of war is that if that whole thing blows up, and our people are there, um, we, we could be living in a, in a very different world in as little as a couple of weeks from now. So this is a, I just want people to understand this is a very scary time. Uh, uh, and, uh, and just remember that in warfare, ever since the arrival of the 20th century, warfare has mostly been leveled against civilians. And so what's happening in the Gaza Strip is not unusual. By the way, it's exactly what's happening in Ukraine. That doesn't make the news as much, but uh, uh, we make war on civilian populaces. Uh, and that, for our sensibilities, that's very difficult because in the history of warfare prior to the 20th century, warfare was about soldiers fighting other soldiers and sailors fighting other sailors and Marines fighting other Marines, all that. But warfare today is about crushing civilian will, destroying their infrastructure. Um, you know, there's a lots of things that are out there uh, in the last, say, in the last 30 years, uh, two million Iraqis have been killed. Uh, and the United States had a lot to do with that. Um, but the one thing we I think we should all hope for is that this thing does not blow up. Um, but I am very worried about what's going to happen in Gaza. OK, anyway, that was enough of that. And hopefully got a little bit of domestic in there. And so let us move on. That's a great point, uh, Dr. Caverly, and I wanted to point out again uh, that Israeli foreign policy has changed forever regarding Hamas, and it's important that we note Hamas is not Palestinian. Palestinian is not Hamas. Hamas is the government recognized by the EU, the UK, the US, and other nation states as a terrorist organization. So the Israelis have made the decision, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, to annihilate Hamas, not the Palestinians. Um, but again, when you're dealing with urban fighting, as Dr. Cavalli said, it is a horrific, horrific environment where civilian casualties are impossible to avoid no matter how many different methods that you use. And the Israelis do use different methods to avoid civilian casualties. It is going to be a, a, a horrific, horrific event, uh, annihilating Hamas when Hamas specifically embeds itself within the civilian population. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that we're going to be able to. And by the way, you know, if you want um, a more uh, in-depth treatment of the, um, uh, you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict of that sort of thing, you're not going to find that uh, today, unfortunately. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we we could spend you know the next six hours on you know the background of that. Um, there will be. At some point, uh, a uh, faculty Q and A uh, with a professor, probably me, because um, I think I'm the only person that volunteered um, on this topic. Um, that will be published soon, um, and you may want to keep an eye out for that. But um, but until then, um, you know, you'll just have to, uh, well. Um, your own research, I guess, uh, <laughs> even though that that phrase has become uh, unfortunately attached to a lot of bad ideas uh, of late. Um, but nonetheless, and particularly when particularly when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, doing your own research will definitely lead you down some rabbit holes of misinformation. So um, and that's one of the things I'm going to try to avoid when I'm I'm writing this thing, which is the, one of the reasons why I haven't written it out yet so um because it, it is a very complex topic and one that is very easy to caricature one way or the other and uh not uh, give a fair treatment to um 
So um, with that, I uh, want to move on to hopefully a little bit uh, lighter um, uh, discussion. Um, and that is um, uh, the um, situation with the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So um, as some of you may know, um, a few weeks ago, we had a Speaker of the House. Um, again, it probably seems like months ago, but... Um, but we did. Um, but he was uh, uh, removed by a few members of the uh, majority party who voted uh, for something called a motion to vacate the chair. Um, so, um, so what is currently going on with that, um, and how um, how is this sort of interregnum um, affecting um, government in the meantime? Because we do have, after all, a federal budget that uh, should have been passed. Oh, I don't know, three weeks ago already. Um, and we're kind of, uh, you know, muddling through in the meantime. Dr. Kaplan, did you want to start on that one? Oh, sure. Uh, well, the, uh, so, um, so there's two theories that are in, um, in, in congressional studies that, that I think are maybe worth thinking about on this. So, uh, a, um, one one theory that um, that has been proffered this years ago is something called conditional party government, and and what it what it worked on is it said that that the Congress would utilize its political parties to hold together, um, but they could only do that for a certain period of time, and then they would inevitably uh, fall apart. Uh, and because at the end of the day, it's the Constitution is very clear um, that members of the, the U.S. congressmen, representatives, and senators are the most powerful uh, parliamentarians in the world. Um, they uh, uh, let me rephrase that in the Western world, in the in the in the the idea of liberal democratic institutions. You know, um, we don't have parliamentary backbenchers. They all have lines in the budget. They all have guarantees of power. They're actually exclusive of, uh, of um, they don't owe the president, they don't owe their job to the president. They, owe, they don't owe their job to the speaker of the house. They don't owe their job to the Senate majority leader or minority. They get there on their own. They stay there on their own. They develop their own linkages with the parties, with the medias, with the voters, with the public opinion, with the social movements, with the interest groups. Uh, they're powerful people and that tends to make um, party government a conditionality. And that's been especially true with the decline of the parties as organizational entities. Um, it, back in the days, which we sorry more for your history classes when they tell you about, teach you about the party machines and the party organizations, but one of the unintended consequences of the progressive movement and, and related movements was that it created uh, a body ultimately of weak parties, um, where it's no longer controlled candidate nomination and the conduct of elections. So the party as an organizing force in the government is conditioned on the likelihood that these voters will follow along. There's an alternative theory to conditional party government that was proffered, it was called pivotal voter. And it was just sort of a, a an old idea about rat from rational choice theory that said that at the end of the day, to get anything done, there's a pivotal voter. Um, and sometimes that pivotal voter is the 50% plus one. Sometimes it that pivotal voter is just whoever it is to, to, to get to a quorum. Sometimes that pivotal voter over in the Senate is somebody that can beat a filibuster. Um, but that pivotal voter that getting to that minimum winning threshold is what governing in the Congress is all about. And when they fail to do that, they fall apart. So if we look at this thing through that lens, those two lenses of those theoretical models, uh, you can kind of say, well, conditional party government <laughs> has once again been conditioned right out because of the rise of the pivotal voters. And the pivotal voter in this case was one guy. Uh, and he can, he's the representative out of, uh, out of Pensacola, Florida, and his name is Matt Gates. Uh, and um, the uh, 
so the the question that that this is begged is is what can you do? Um, well, the parties. Remember, the parties organized the government. Uh, so they still have that job. Um, but the uh, so there's been a lot of talk about. Well, yeah, but you know these eight Republicans joined with the Democrats. Listen, the the Democrats. The Democrats are just sitting back um, and waiting for their shot, waiting for their chance in all of this. Uh, the Democrats were would have only saved McCarthy if he had went to them hat in hand and made a whole bunch of concessions to them. And Kim, speak, Speaker McCarthy wasn't willing to do that. So uh, um, Minority Leader Jeffries said, well, then, OK, fall on your sword. So he. They, that's what happened. Uh, but this, it's a fascinating thing. You know, if, if you go back, um, the last time they tried to, to axe a speaker um, was around the time of the speaker's revolt back in 1910. And believe it or not, Joe Cannon actually survived it. He, he was the old czar. He survived it, but he had to cut a deal to survive it. He cut a deal that he would leave the Rules Committee. And when he did that, the unintended consequence of that was the rules committee changed the rules. They threw out what were called the Reed's rules. And from that moment on, we had the modern Congress of today that where pivotal voters on a regular basis overtake that conditional part of government. But that's something that I would like to think about. What you're seeing playing out at this at this time is a, a kind of an extreme version of it. But in a in a smaller way, the Congress has this problem over almost everything. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's not really one Congress. It's not even two Congresses, meaning the House and the Senate. It's 535 separate Congresses. Um, uh, Joe Biden once said he was trying to deal with the Senate. He was once said, and it, remember, he used to be a senator. He, he, he said, he said, you know, he said, really, he said, it's 100 Senates. It's 100 Senates. And, and it was a time of frustration, kind of making a joke about it. But he used to be one of them. Um, and that's this is an extreme example of that. But one of the things, if you want to try and find a silver lining, and I'm going to be quiet on this, but if you want to find a silver lining is that to some extent, this is where um, separation of powers and checks and balances within an institution is coming about. Um, that. Um, that it's checking the control of, of, uh, of, of party leadership. But the problem is that they've so checked it that, you know, when, when they can't, if, if you will, in, in, the, in the 18th, 19th century, what the Congress did really well was it legislated at the national level. Now it was a small government back then, but they, could, they did that through the parties. But what they haven't been able to do in the 20th and 21st century is they've broken up and become more of a representative assembly of increasingly, I'll just keep calling them the, the um, roadies term, pivotal voters. And uh, they're great at representative. You know, people get mad at Matt Gaetz, but the simple truth of the matter is, look, and he represents, he represents his constituency in Pensacola very well. The problem with that is by him doing that, you could maybe argue he's hurt the country as a whole. But again, that's the great dilemma of the Congress. That happens all the time. OK, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Hall. Great summary there. Um, not much to add other than just some basic details of what's happening. Um, as we have covered in class with uh, many of my students. The US House of Representatives has 435 members. Um, currently, there is a very, very small Republican majority. I believe it's 221 Republicans to so about 212 Democrats with a couple of um, vacancies and the vacancies even out, one's Democrat, one's Republican. What we're seeing here in the Republican Party in the House is unprecedented. Uh, decapitating themselves the way they have done uh, is something that we just have not seen, taking out your own speaker. This is interesting because it is, um, it is symbolic of a revolution of sorts that is going on in the Republican Party. Uh, the Democratic Party in years, in recent years past, had even smaller majorities in the House, but were still able to to legislate. This is a very specific Republican issue. I would say easily you could mark 2010 and the emergence of the Tea Party and then eventually the Trump administration winning in 2016. You have, as Dr. Cavalli pointed out, 
in our system of government, our congressional system, incredibly strong individual members of the legislature and a weak party system. And as a result, you have, as again, you said with uh, regard to Representative Gates in Florida, you have people who are doing exactly what their constituents want. And there are a number of current, what I'm going to call Trump slash MAGA voters, whatever makes you feel more comfortable, who look at the thought of an in, of a of an impotent, kneecapped Congress that can't do anything. And they look at that and they think, absolutely, that's what we want. So in many ways, many representatives are doing exactly what their constituents want. Now, how will this impact our government moving forward? It will bring it to a standstill. We do not have a House of Representatives right now for all practical purposes. Without a Speaker of the House or without some serious bipartisan rule changes, the House of Representatives is not going to be able to do anything. We are currently under a continuing resolution that should end in mid-November, at which point the federal government's probably going to shut down if the Republicans haven't fixed this particular problem. You have to think about it. After they decapitated their own Speaker of the House voluntarily. This is proactively done by a small minority of Republicans. Keep in mind, if you have a 221 seat majority in the House, that means you can lose like what, four or five representatives and you no longer have the majority. Um, they then went with the next best available individual to be the Speaker who was the majority leader. He lost. They then went with the Judiciary Chairman, uh, Jim Jordan, who just this Friday, after a third or fourth vote, lost and pulled his name out. There are now no fewer than nine Republicans vying for the Speaker. They want that gavel, and I do not see any math that will necessarily put any of them in the Speakership. So this is a catastrophe for the Republican Party, in my opinion, because they are showing the American public that's paying attention one thing. They can't govern. They have a majority in the House and they cannot govern. The civil war within the Republican Party has completely taken away their ability to govern. Keep in mind, there are many Republican constituents who want that, who like that. They are they, they look at government being incapacitated and think that's exactly what we want, because for a number of reasons, they don't like the federal government. Having said that, what are the projections? How is this going to affect the government moving forward? It's going to basically bring it to a by God standstill. It is a nightmare uh, to think of mid-November uh, and how long a government shutdown could go if, I can't imagine the Republicans won't have a speaker by mid-November, but at the same time, I couldn't describe to you how they will get a speaker uh, given what we have seen. So it's gonna be, for lack of a better word, interesting moving forward. Um, beyond that, yeah, it's a little scary, the thought of having a government that really can't do anything. And all of this, while in many respects, the world is burning down around us. We have the continued war in Ukraine. We have a war between Israel and Gaza. And the Biden administration, while recently asking for about $105 billion of additional aid to the Ukrainians and to Israel, about a little over $10 billion of that going to Israel, about $64 billion going to Ukraine, we can't get that done. Um, so this is kind of a political nightmare. This is one of the worst case scenarios in the fractured, separated government created by Madison. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm as afraid of what's happening right now in the House as I am of many other issues we've talked about. I don't see how it ends. I don't have a positive spin on that. My apologies. <laughs> Well, I, I don't know about I, to, to try and find again. We try and find a silver lining here. I, I would say this: uh, they're going to exact they're going to exact cost from them. But uh, so I'll make a prediction, and I'm usually wrong in my prediction, but I'll make a shot. At a certain point, the Demo they're going to get the Democrats. They're going to get a they're going to negotiate with Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader, and they're going to sliver of Democrats who will join the moderates and the traditional conservatives, not the Matt Gates, uh, the hard end of the Freedom Caucus, but the traditional conservatives. They'll get a coalition of the willing, a very small working majority, but probably only one or two votes, and, and, uh, and they'll get some. Now, the thing is about, I don't know if any of these nine people that are currently running are going to be that person. Um, um, so 
that's my that we'll see if I'm correct on that. But but I think eventually they're going to have to do something because uh, otherwise uh, they're going to get too afraid that they're going to get punished in the polls. And in particular, they've got the former president who's trying to become president again, uh, you know, nipping at their heels, uh, telling them, listen, you got to You got to get something going here because I'm trying to I'm trying to beat Joe Biden. Uh, so. Um, anyway, we'll see what happens in there, but but I, I think that I, I do think that that they're going to ultimately make a shot, uh, but they're going to probably require the Democrats, which is what they had to do in order to get a uh, uh, the last budget agreement and stuff like that. They'll have to do that uh, to get a um, to get something else through. And and remember, each time they do this, the Democrats are going to exact a cost from them. Um, uh, Jeffries is not just going to give them. Uh, a, a, a victory on a platter, and because that's you know that's that's partisan politics. But we'll see. Um, hopefully, hopefully something like that happens, and we don't completely burn down. Uh, yeah. So, um, so a couple things I, I would just add to that. Um, first thing is that um, yeah, yeah, I think at the end, the end of the day, right? There is a um, a, as Dr. Kavli says, right, there, there is a point at which, um, you know, there is going to be a, I don't know, we call it a coalition of the winning, willing or whatever you want to call it, but um, there are enough people for whom governing is in their interest uh, to get something done. Now, the the point, the, I guess the the underlying sort of end game here question is, and this is the thing that that's really been the problem even from the very beginning of this, is that Gates is getting worse outcomes than he would get had he kept um, McCarthy in the speakership, right? Um, because w when the Republicans hang together, they can get stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if he and Marjorie Taylor Greene and these other you know hardcore Freedom Caucus people defect, you know, the quote unquote coalition, the willing has to go with the Democrats. Right. And while that might be great for their 2024 fundraising and it might be great for their districts, one, they're going to get reelected anyway. So why do they care? Um, and number two, um, if you think about it in terms of policy, they get worse policy because, you know, um, you know, Gates is not getting across the board budget cuts to everything except defense, which is what he wants, right? Um, he's not going to get a cut off, uh, you know, the the anti-Ukraine aid people are not going to get a cut off of aid to Ukraine if the Democrats have, because that's going to be, you know, a condition of any deal with the Democrats. They're not going to, they're not going to do any deal that doesn't involve giving, uh, giving aid to Ukraine. And, you know, the, um, the pro-Putin, anti-Ukraine, whatever wing you want to call it, um, you know, is going to do worse out of that than, you know, having the a negotiated, I mean, the, you know, a deal with Ukraine, they're going to be, Ukraine's going to get some money, right? But they're probably going to get more money if they have to deal with the Democrats than, um, you know, in the House than if they don't. It's just simple, you know, uh, going back to what Dr. Cavalry was talking about, coalition politics and veto pivots and this sort of thing, right? Um, which I realize is a very high flute jargon among political scientists, but um, but that but that's how negotiations work is, you know, if you, you, you know, you build a coalition based on um, what people are willing to accept and, um, you know, if people aren't willing to deal, then um, then you go and find somebody else you're going to deal with. And um, again, you know, while that might be good for your um, fundraising, um, if you really care about policy, and again, you know, maybe they don't care about policy, right? That could be the, um, you know, if they just want government to fail or if they just want to, um, you know, run against their own party, um, then, you know, if they're nihilists, um, then maybe that's fine with them. Um, but there's going to be a cost to that, right? And eventually the cost is going to be are, are the Republicans who want the government to function at some level going to tolerate that, right? At some level, you know, this stuff works with a angry subset of voters that shows up in the primaries. But, you know, the people that bankroll these campaigns, the people that 
you know, the quote unquote Main Street Republicans, the Wall Street Republicans, they need a government that functions um, just as much as the Democrats do. Um, and eventually they're going to say either, you know, you know, I mean, the, the, we've been careening towards this for, you know, arguably, I would say probably 30 years, um, going back to Newt Gingrich, um, you know, and it's just one of those things that, you know, Newt thought he could control these sort of ideas and he couldn't, right? Um, and, you know, we're saying, and then the Tea Party emerged and the people that were kind of egging on the Tea Party thought they could control it and they couldn't. And then, you know, the people that pushed to, you know, forward Trump thought they could control him and they couldn't. Um, and now we have, you know, nihilists, basically. Um, not most Republicans, but some, right? Just enough to to be a real, you know, pain for everybody that wants to get things done. Um, the other thing is, if you're fascinated by these sort of discussions, that sort of thing, um, I have the class for you on the uh, on the spring schedule. We have a, a class on Congress. Um, first time we've taught that in about five years. So if you're interested in learning more about that, all you have to have is American government. Um, it'll be um, Mondays and Wednesdays. I think it's 11, if I'm not mistaken, 11 or 12.30, I can't remember which. It's on the schedule, um, but all you need is American government first. Um, you don't have to be a political science major to take the class. Um, hopefully, um, if these sort of discussions are interesting, if you want to learn what a um, conditional party government and veto pivots and all these things are, um, um, you know, Paul, uh, uh, procedural cartel cartels. Uh, we will we will talk about all these things um, in that class. If those things make your eyes glaze over, um, that's okay. We'll talk about some other things too. Um, we'll talk about the history of Congress and um, the structure of Congress and things like that in a lot more detail as well. So um, let's see. Um, so uh, one more thing before I get on to the next question, uh, not a self promotional thing. Um, for um, our um, audience, um, if you do have questions or if there are things you need and want clarified, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Um, while you're thinking about your questions, that sort of thing, let's go ahead and move on to our uh, next question. Uh, we're going to turn a little bit to state politics um, and um, talk a little bit about the budget. So. Um, so as, as many, some of you may be aware, uh, for the last couple of years, we've accumulated a bit of a budget surplus here in Georgia, and I, I think the surplus is now at a record level. Um, and, um, you know, the question is, well, you know, now we have this money, what should we do with it? Um, you know, I'm always a, always a good problem to have, usually. Um, so, uh, Dr. Hall, do you want to uh, start on that one? Yes, this is a great topic in terms of champagne problems. This is the one that you want to have. Um, the state of Georgia in the last fiscal year brought in a little bit over $5 billion of budget surplus. This goes with what we already had, um, and that put us uh, with over $10 billion in extra cash to spend. Uh, again, budget surpluses are fantastic. The federal government actually had one uh, toward the latter part of the Clinton administration in the 1990s. But there's more to the story than that. We also have over $5 billion uh, in a rainy day fund, over $2 billion in the Education Lottery Reserve Fund, which brings Georgia to over $18 billion that we have in some form of reserve funding. But for our purposes here, we're going to look at the little over $10 billion that we have uh, as surplus from the last few budgets. Um, what to do with that? That's being debated right now. Um, there are those who would like uh, to spend that money on infrastructure. There are those who would like to spend that money on education. Um, there are those who would like to spend that money. And a lot of those fall into the uh, Democratic Party minority in Atlanta. Um, the Kemp administration has several ideas for how to spend this. Uh, we are we have just gone through a second round of state income tax rebates where a little over a billion dollars of the budget surplus went back. Uh, to Georgia taxpayers. Uh, there might be a third round of tax rebates that the Kemp administration is looking into, uh, but that's really not getting at the lion's share of that budget proposal. Some Republicans, uh, particularly the lieutenant governor, uh, want to use the budget surplus uh, to work toward eventually eliminating Georgia's income tax altogether. Um, Georgia has also in the last year, I believe year, maybe two, um, 
reduced or actually gotten rid of our gas tax and our diesel tax, which amounts to somewhere in the realm of about $185 million per month. So, so far in terms of where we could possibly spend the budget surplus, the Kemp administration has already shown his desire and willingness to send it back or parts of it back in terms of income tax uh, rebates. Uh, the more aggressive uh, goal by particularly the Republican Party would be uh, to eventually eradicate the income tax altogether. Um, recent budgets, strangely enough, with the budget surplus have actually been a little austere. Uh, there have been reductions, and this hits home personally to the University System of Georgia's budget. Uh, the last budget cycle, I believe it was over $60, bill, uh, 60 million dollars cut from the University System of Georgia. So while we are accumulating this ever increasing budget surplus, several state agencies and departments are actually being reduced in terms of their funding. So at the end of the day, this is a debate between the traditional Republican and Democratic parties in Georgia, what to do with the money. There are a lot of ideas uh, for what to do with the money. And currently the Democratic Party is nowhere near um, control over the legislature or the governor's mansion. So we will probably be going whichever route the Republicans decide, and we will probably go that route when Republicans decide what to do. There is also the possibility of limited tax rebates to Georgia taxpayers while continuing to accumulate more and more of this money. There's some debate that it could be used uh, to improve uh, health care in Georgia, particularly in rural areas, uh, but right now we just do not know. That's pretty much where Atlanta is right now. We are still in the process of debating what to do with it without any grand scheme that looks like it has uh, the support of the legislative branch and the governor. That's a quick little run through. Might have left some uh, openings there for Dr. Caverly. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hall. So uh, the uh, I don't have too much to add other than to say that uh, that uh, uh, I agree completely. This is going to be a this going Georgia. So Georgia gets a lot in the news at the presidential level and talk about Georgia as a purple state and all that. But Georgia, Georgia has a uh, long legacy of uh, it used to be Democratic Party dominance and, you know, then it became Republican Party dominance. But the, the point is there's there's legacies of one partism here in Georgia and they are manifested in, in gubernatorial control and and most of the, the state cabinet offices and, and of course, the both houses of the Georgia General Assembly, the state legislature. So this is going to be a Republican only show for the most part. Um, so uh, here's what Republicans are really good at. So we, we talked before when we looked at the House of Representatives, <laughs> which are maybe not so good at, uh, at least right now. But here's what they are really good at. They're really good at giving tax cuts. Uh, they're really good at sending money back out to um, the voters. But what they mean by that is usually the higher end voters, the, the, the um, um, you know, the, 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 because of the, the progressive taxation schemes, the, the, the more you make, the more you pay. So they, uh, they're really good at 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 giving money to um, wealthy people and big corporations. And my guess is, this is just a guess, that they're probably going to do something like that with at least a, a significant portion of this money. Um, they're using some kind of development for high end, you know, whatever. Uh, um, where uh, they might utilize monies um, uh, in uh, in sort of a, a, a traditional kind of, uh, I'd say, a less kind of, uh, you know, no, we're actually going to spend money for a, a public program. Uh, my guess they're going to spend a lot on agriculture uh, because uh, uh, Georgia is, uh, uh, agriculture is, again, legacies. Now, Georgia is becoming an increasingly uh, economically diverse uh, economy. I mean, it, it's it's got manufacturing and it's got service sector. And my God, we got a movie industry here. And 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 uh, so Georgia is is kind of increasingly becoming like certain other big big relatively big economies in the states around the country. 
but there's legacies. And one of those legacies is agriculture. We are an agricultural state in, in our background. Um, we are we are Georgia peanuts and Georgia cotton and Georgia this and Georgia that. And 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 um, uh, my guess is I think that they're going to spend um, some money on that. If you want to talk about the, the, the rural um, medical program, uh, the, the suggestion for it, I would argue that that is also a legacy of the agricultural basis, rural based economy. Of old of old Georgia that has lived on a path dependency. Um, there um, there might be matching stuff that goes on with some of the public infrastructure. Um, you know uh, they're getting a lot. They're going to get they're getting a lot of money from that uh, infrastructure act, but um, there could be additions on that. They might finally finish the highway system around Macon. That's annoying. Anyway, that was a personal comment. I asked that that be removed. Um, I've been here eight years and I've been working on the same stretch of road. Um, the uh, uh, so, but in writ large, what what explains this? I would argue, in some ways, with Georgia is Georgia is at least in terms of political economy. Georgia is a traditionalist political culture, what Daniel Elazar would have called it. Um, it's limited government. Uh, it's states' rights become local rights, and um, you know they're 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 not going to. So notice, uh, 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 Dr. Hall mentioned. Well, what they cut? <laughs> they cut public education. Uh, they money to public education, particularly they cut it to colleges and universities. Well, why is that? Well, because the you know the rap on on people that work in in our industry is that we're a bunch of so-called woke liberals. Uh, and so they're going to get at us. Um, so that that makes sense. But the, the, so uh, from a you know why they would why they why would you cut public higher ed uh, when you have all these surpluses? Because you don't like the people in public higher ed. You can do it because your the Republican Party has a legacy of dominance. So that that's an example on it. But so I would I would think that the, the way to 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 kind of game this might be to think about who's going to have the power. To do it, it's a Republican Party. What are they going to do? They're going to do Republican Party things. Uh, so, are they going to do? Are they going to do a whole lot with civil rights? Are they going to spend a lot of money on civil rights? Probably not, because that's not their jam, right? That's not what that's not what Republicans do. Uh, will they give money to law enforcement? Good shot, law enforcement, fire, EMS. Uh, those cats might get some more money. Um, 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 Dr. Hall mentioned, you know, I, I leave a part of my life in the military. We, we in the, the military side, we might get a few bucks, but that would make sense. That would be predictable on a, um, a Republican dominated framework, if you will, which is the best way, I think, to think about what the budgetary surplus politics. But it is kind of a nice thing to talk about, you know, the politics of the black rather than the red, right? All right. Thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Catholic. Um, yeah, I think there are a couple of caveats or additions I would make. First, um, you know, the the first thing is, you know, we we are headed into an election year, right? So, 2024, um, you know, the members of the general assembly are going to be up for re-election. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, we don't have statewide races in the same way, um, but um, but nonetheless, they're going to want to try to put the best foot forward for their parties. Um, and usually election years are good spending years just because of that, right? You want to you want to spread the wealth a little bit um, just to, you know, um, grease the skids at the polls a little bit. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say that's one thing that you might want to look at is, or consider is that there is going to be probably some degree of loosening of the purse strings just because uh, it's an election year and it's in members' best interest uh, to be able to take credit for for some spending. Um, and I would say also that, um, you know, Dr. Cavalier is quite right to point out things like rural development and things like that, hospitals, as uh, Dr. Hall mentioned, you know, rural healthcare has certainly been a big issue that's emerged over the last few years in Georgia. Um, and it's one where there's probably going to be a lot of bipartisan agreement. And so, um, and I think also for the future of the state, um, 
you know, the state, um, I think state government has an interest in, you know, making uh, making sure that Georgia does not become overly centric on Atlanta um, and a few other, you know, urban areas. Um, you know, rural, rural depopulation becomes a cost train on the state, um, you know, because you still have to provide services, you still have to provide roads, you still have to provide all these things, but if there's not a tax base there, um, then it becomes a thing where you have to extract that from the places that do have people. Um, and then they start asking questions like, well, you know, why am I spending money to build roads in, um, you know, in Bainbridge, right? Um, when I'm up here in Atlanta and I'm stuck in traffic all the time uh, and that sort of thing. And so, um, you know, we're already trending in the direction where basically half of the state's populations in Metro Atlanta. Um, I think that's something that if, if state lawmakers had their druthers, um, they probably would want to reverse. Um, that's a trend that probably is, I would say, you know, demographically, I'd say also that having a, a unicentric sort of state in that way is not, is not politically healthy for a state. Um, you know, um, having, having lived in states that, um, you know, have multiple centers of power, I think that, that kind of helps, um, ensure that everybody gets a little bit of the the pie a bit better than you know kind of it's Atlanta and everything else um so, so that's the first thing I would say the, the other thing I would say uh, in terms of uh, of the budget is you know the you can also you also need to to consider the personalities involved and things like that and um you know the particular situation with the university system was very much driven by one lawmaker and a, kind of an unrelated dispute and so um, if those issues are resolved or papered over or addressed, um, then that doesn't necessarily mean those problems are going to arise in the future budget. So, um, so that's something to consider. Um, and also, you know, Governor Kemp has shown that he's not averse to using the line item veto to retaliate against that, something that perhaps some lawmakers didn't anticipate when, uh, when they were doing some of those cuts. Because after all these, uh, you know, when it comes to the governor's budget, the governor wants that money. It's not like the governor was asking for, um, this was not something that, you know, university professors were asking for. This is something the governor was asking for. And he saw that as retaliation against him, not just simply, you know, those woke liberal professors, um, because it really wasn't, right? It was really targeted at, you know, something this particular lawmaker wasn't happy about. Um, and... Um, and that's something to consider as well. Um, so the other thing I would say about, about, you know, government spending and prospects for government spending is, you know, Georgia is one of the few states that doesn't have a, uh, statewide need-based financial aid program for, for, for college students. Um, that's something where potentially there could be some bipartisan agreement, I think. Um, uh, particularly given, you know, that, um, you know, access to, you know, the state university system is increasingly expensive. I think that might be a cheaper way to get some of those costs down for lawmakers than giving more money. Um, another thing is the state may find itself in a legal position where it has to give more money to other universities and things like this. Um, the the uh, administration, the um, uh, Biden administration, um, has actually basically told Georgia and several other states that they're underfunding some HBCUs and they will be sued if they don't um, find more money for them. Um, and while certainly, obviously, that would money would primarily seem to go likely to be likely to go to HBCUs, I think politically it'd be hard to say we're going to give you know, say an extra thousand dollars per student to Fort Valley State University without also giving that money to other universities as well at the same time. I think politically that would be a hard sell in the legislature um, since there are other underfunded universities in the system. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I, I think there are, you know, um, that's a, the other thing I would say mention is, you know, inflation is not going away. Um, and um, there's a good chance that um, they may need to raise salaries again just to simply keep up with inflation, things like that. We've already seen a couple of cost of living increases from the legislature. That may be an area where, again, you know, they, the money may be identified. Although the uh, the flip side of that is, right, you don't want to create um, structural costs, right, because, you know, the the budget surplus that we're seeing 
may not persist, right? And so, um, so they're going to be cautious about recurring spending, and that would suggest things like, for example, one-time spending, like infrastructure spending, or um, you know, something on rural hospitals, or maybe you know, giving money to universities for endowments and things like that, as opposed to kind of operational spending, which tends to be something that puts you on the hook in the long term. Um, which is also a reason why they pro why I would say that using the money to try to cut the income tax is relatively unlikely. I think there are some lawmakers that would like to do that. Um, and that would be great for their own personal political aspirations, but it also means they would be putting themselves in a bit of a hole down the road. Um, because there's only so much you can cut from the income tax or that sort of thing. Um and so I think it's probably more likely we'll see kind of more of these one-time kind of deals um, just simply because, you know, structurally long-term, you know, um, if you if you cut the income tax, then that money isn't there when there's a downturn and income tax is one of those things that actually, you know. And, and the other thing I would say about income tax is increasing because of the demographics of who pays income tax. Um because of the movies that shoot in Georgia, because of these sort of things, because of professional athletes, um, a lot of income tax is not paid by Georgians anymore. Um, you know, if we're bringing in a lot of people from out of state to, um, you know, do stuff, um, it's, actually, it's actually in our interest to tax people that are have high incomes because many of them don't live in Georgia. Um and and that's something to be aware of as well. And uh, and from the Republicans' perspective, they're losing a lot of richer voters. Uh, um, you know, there has been a little bit of a demographic shift in terms of who's actually supporting the parties. And um, the Republicans may see in the future that they actually don't mind so much soaking the rich. Um, we've already seen some of this at the federal level, um, where the uh, the cut in the um, uh itemized deductions for example was something where um you know essentially that was uh something that targeted uh relatively well off taxpayers um which traditionally you would think were of, as being republican but you know in in that case most of the people that benefit from that reduction tend to be democrats so um so things to consider um definitely we're in a, a very interesting sort of time as far as those things are concerned um let's see so um we talked a little bit about we didn't talk about medicaid in this context but there is some discussion of expanding medicaid um by the way also if you have questions feel free to post them in the chat nobody's posting questions not to say you have to but if you do have questions ask them um because we do have about 15 minutes left so time for a couple more questions so speaking of medicaid expansion um so governor kep has Put out a limited expansion of Medicaid. Um, how has that been going? How has it been criticized? That sort of thing. Um, I'll keep it very brief. Um, Matt, did you want to answer oh, that? Or? Sure. Uh, sure. Well, the uh, so um, back when um, uh, Obamacare, uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, was put through, a part of the Affordable Care Act was um, uh, expansion of Medicaid. Um, and of course, for those people that, that, that don't know this, that just kind of get in the weeds on policy, uh, Medicaid is, uh, is actually administered by the states. Um, so uh, they have greater discretionary authority in what they can do with it. Um, so uh, Georgia, along with a bunch of other uh, uh, Republican-leaning states, um, chose to opt out of that Medicaid expansion. Um, but what has happened over time is that um, we've had some financial crises along the way. And uh, the reality is that uh, when we talk about inflation effects, well, Inflation has actually been a bit asymmetric, but uh, one of the great areas that has been an ongoing problem has been health inflation. Uh, health costs have been going through the roof for years, a bit like education inflation, also going through the roof for the 
the years. So we have talked before about getting money back into get money into education. I mean, one of one of the principal calls of that is just that the, it's it's getting more and more expensive to college degree. But that's especially it's especially true, you know, in in uh, in in uh, medical costs. Uh, so at a certain point, uh, it, it seems that many of these states uh, that had previously so hated the Medicaid expansion of the of the old uh, ACA uh, have either adopted it or they have uh, tried to develop their own sort of expansion. And that's kind of it seems that that seems what we're doing here in Georgia. We're we, we're, we're not adopting the the full blown uh, Medicaid expansion uh, of the of the ACA, but we're adopting a limited expansion. Um, and again, uh, some of this comes down to um, I think that uh, that uh, Chair Lawrence there was 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 really on to something with the just the demographic changes within the Republican Party as the Republican Party has become more working class uh, in in um, white working class incidentally not not necessarily non white working class but has become more more white working class uh, class issues like um, health care. Uh, access have become increasingly important. We already saw an example of that, by the way, with the rule, um, the the money put into rural rural healthcare. Well, I think this fits that same that same um, area. You know, um, uh, the, the recognition that uh, uh, people just can't afford to go to the doctor, uh, and um, they can't afford to go to the hospital. And so what's happened, they're going to emergency rooms and they're racking up medical bills and they're like, I can't pay it. Here's five dollars a month for the rest of my life. And uh, and so the system. Is either arguably already broken or it's teetering on the edge of, of falling into the abyss. And so this is an attempt uh, to put a Band-Aid uh, on, a, on a hemorrhaging wound. Um, uh, and so we'll see how this works out. Um, but but uh, uh, but I understand that the governor is looking for a win here and he's looking for a win. And within the mode of. The limited government ethos of conservative uh, political economy, but I think that that Georgia, like many other states, has had to face the reality that, look, you can you can watch your health care system completely collapse or you could do something. And so they've chosen. They're tr they're doing something, um, but obviously the Democrats would prefer. And so this is the criticism. The Democratic criticism is, well, why doing this? Why don't you just just take the full blown expansion? Um, so anyway, I think that's that's what really frames the uh, frames that argument and the, and the kind of the frames the the decision of of what the governor is trying to do here. So I'll turn it over to Professor Hall. Great summary there. Um, when you when you look at the heart of this question, this issue, you have to go to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which Dr. Caverly mentioned. Um, this signature Obama administration legislation had twin pillars that would make it work. On the one hand, there would be the individual mandate, which would require anyone and everyone who does not have uh, health insurance. Think about, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s. If you're healthy, you, people would not get health insurance and require them to get some kind of federally uh, recognized basic health insurance. That was immediately challenged, and Chief Justice Roberts, in the Sebelius opinion, upheld the individual mandate. He upheld it as a congressional power to tax. Now, the second pillar of the Affordable Care Act, which would make it work, was the Medicaid expansion, uh, expanding all states, forcing all states to expand their Medicaid rolls up to 138% of the federal poverty line. This was a bridge too far for the Roberts court, and they struck this down uh, as an unconstitutional uh, use of legislative power. So basically, the Affordable Care Act was kept alive by allowing the individual mandate to continue, but it was kind of crippled from day one by not requiring states to expand their Medicaid rolls. Now, this pitted for simplicity Democrats versus Republicans. Republican states said, absolutely not. While we have the ability to choose to expand our Medicaid. Republican states said, hell no. Democratic states said, absolutely. But as Dr. Cavley mentioned, economic um, 
catastrophes since then <laughs> have gone beyond politics. When you cannot afford to go to the hospital, when you cannot afford a doctor, and you know all your governor and legislature has to do is agree to Medicaid expansion and boom, you are instantaneously going to be one of the people who now has Medicaid coverage. That changes things. Right now, 40 states, North Carolina is the most recent, theirs won't really take effect until the end of the year, 40 states have expanded their Medicaid roles. Keep in mind, when you expand your Medicaid roles, as Dr. Cavalier mentioned, these are state-run uh, operations. How are you going to afford it? Well, the Affordable Care Act calls for 95% of the additional medical costs for the first two years to be covered by the federal government, and 90% after that to be covered by the federal government for all eternity. So states that choose not to expand their Medicaid roles, they know year in and year out, like Georgia, they are costing themselves billions and billions and billions of dollars. And it's the sweet money from the federal government. It's money that comes from the entire republic. So Georgia is one of the last 10 states. When you look at the states that still have not expanded Medicaid, it's Georgia, South Carolina, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, Texas. These are heavily Republican states that are still holding out. What Governor Kemp is doing here is like a diet caffeine free version of Medicaid expansion, and he's trying to connect it to employment. Uh, this is something that he actually had to go to federal court and he won. Um, the federal court allowed for the connection of Medicaid expansion to employment, but it's a lot trickier than just expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Um, as a result, and these numbers, when I actually looked at them earlier today, I was amazed at these numbers. There are only a few thousand Georgians who are signed up and on board with this new employment connected Medicaid expansion, mainly because it's just a lot harder. If you have to prove employment, prove that you're working 80 hours a month, if you have to bring in all this paperwork to the state of Georgia, there are a lot of people who simply do not have the time or the ability uh, to do that. So, so far, um, a Medicaid expansion connected directly to employment, uh, which should be targeting upwards of 100,000 Georgians, has gotten a couple of thousand Georgians on board. And that does not come close to the near half million Georgians who would be instantaneously covered if Georgia simply expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. So, if I had to describe this, the, this uh, program so far, I would say it's a massive failure in that so many of the people that are expected to be on board of this new Medicaid expansion connected to employment are simply not on board. And the opposition, as Dr. Cavley pointed out, particularly Democrats are sim are screaming from the rooftops and have been for going on the better part of a decade and a half. Why don't we just expand Medicaid under the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act instantaneously providing Medicaid coverage for a half a million Georgians and bringing in billions and billions of dollars that the state is refusing to accept. Having said that, uh, we will see where this goes. This is definitely an innovative policy decision by the Kemp administration. Um, it's one that was supported by the Trump administration, um, but we'll see where it goes. As of right now, it's hard to call it a success, and there are definitely alternatives out there that might be quite simpler. Just noticed that I've been talking for quite a while, and I'll stop now. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, I think that was a good overview from both of you there. Uh, so uh, moving on to our next question, uh, which also has been requested in the chat. Um, so uh, several counties and cities in Georgia are having votes uh, this November in um, just a couple of weeks. Actually, early voting is underway now on uh, what are called something called SPLOST or SPLOSTs. Um, what is a SPLOST? Uh, what are the different types of SPLOST? And how do they differ? Um, uh, uh, Dr. Lester in particular mentioned in the uh, chat, Houston County has a SPLOST, but we can talk about other counties as well or in general. Uh, and Dr. Hall, did you want to start on that one? Yes. Um... Well, for the students at home, um, when you when you look at taxation, Georgia has a a, a special form of taxation. Uh, the term SPLOST, it, it doesn't roll off the tongue. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to say, but it stands for special purpose local option sales tax or SPLOST. Uh, now, this is specifically 
a county level uh, tax that the voters of a particular county have to agree to. It, it comes up as a referendum during the election. Uh, and the revenue from SPLOST, or again, special purpose local option sales tax, um, generally speaking, has to be used for capital outlays. And the tax is subject, again, as I said, to voter approval. Um, and it's, protect, it's collected by the Department of Revenue. There are other forms of taxes like this. Uh, we also have the lost or the local option sales tax. Uh, we have, as the name suggests, education special purpose sales tax uh, that can be used for capital outlay projects for educational purposes specifically. Uh, we also have the what I've always called the TSPLOST or the transportation special purpose sales tax, uh, which again must be approved by voters. Um, and this is another transportation funding option that the state of Georgia uh, has available. So all of these are different forms of sales taxes uh, generally. And I don't know if this is a mandate, but I think I've never seen any, and I can be corrected here, above 1% um, that are available to Georgia voters uh, for very specific um, projects. It's an additional form of revenue uh, that uses a very democratic method uh, for implementation. I know we're running out of time, so I'll open the floor up for any of the comments. Oh, I, I, I think uh, I think uh, Dr. Hall there covered it very well, although I, I will I will say I think I'll defer my time on if if, uh, if Professor Lester is on here, because I know that she is an expert in uh, in Georgia in Georgia policy science. Uh, if, if she's willing to pop in here, she might uh, she might in, be able to enlighten us a little bit better. I'll mean to 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 uh, I think she probably knows this stuff better than better than either than uh, John or myself put together do. I'll pop Maybe in, not. but I'm not going to turn my camera on. Um, you guys know why what's going on in my life. Um, <laughs> yeah, you guys did a great job. Sploss, there are several losts or os taxes in Georgia. Um, it's a county, it's the county has to call for the referendum, but what happens is that they can go into a intergovernmental agreement or local agreement with qualified municipalities in their county to um, use that money. And like Dr. Hall said, uh, 1%, the enabling legislation is 1%. So you're not gonna see a splos of, you know, 4%. The base is 4%. Georgia and then different counties and municipalities have extra taxes on top of that. Some counties don't have SPLOS or some counties use SPLOS differently. So like you said, it was um, <clears throat> for capital projects and they are five-year taxes or if there's an intergovernmental or interlocal agreement between counties and qualified municipalities, uh, they can be six years. And I keep saying qualified municipalities, that's defined in law. As far as most municipalities in Georgia, uh, municipalities are also called cities, if you wonder what I'm talking about here, <laughs> are qualified municipalities. You're a qualified municipality if you have like fire department, police department, public library, wastewater, there's this whole big list. Um, so the reason why I brought Hous Houston County up was just because there is one this year. Um, and I know we probably have some Houston County voters on here who may be like, should I vote for this? Should I not? I'm not going to obviously tell you how to vote. If it does not pass, your taxes will go down by 1% until they bring it back on the ballot again. Um, so some people may be motivated by that. Um, um, some of the different projects are going to use um, the money for uh, an art center, a lot of road extension, because if you live in Houston County or drive in Houston County, you know it's insane. New animal shelter, a lot of money for parks and recreation. And of course, that money would be in the county as well as Centerville, Warner Robins, uh, and Perry. And uh, as far as allocation, I was reading the other day too in Macon Bib, 2025 is when the next blast will come up. And they, Lester Miller said, hey, yeah, we need a new jail. Because if you follow Macon News, I don't think they've found those guys yet. Um, maybe I'm wrong there. Um, but um, so a lot of uh, counties use this money for for projects like that. And there's tier one projects and there's no tier one. And that's getting too much into the weeds on SPLOST. Uh, but it's something that's important, I think, in the narrative, because, of course, I'm really interested in narrative. A lot of people say, well, this is just an extension 
of SPLOS. I don't know what the SPLOS number is for Houston County, but my county has a SPLOS up. We're on SPLOS 6 right now. We got to vote for SPLOS 7 in the November election. So a lot of the narrative has been, well, SPLOS 6 and 7, plus SPLOS 7, if you agree to it, it's just a continuation of SPLOS 6. I call BS on that. That's not true. ACCG would even say that, the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia. I've heard them actually say that in hearings at the State House. It is not a continuation because it's used for different projects. So just something to think about when we talk about policymaking and the stories and the narratives and policy and all the different policy areas that are discussed tonight. Think about how people are using language to shape public opinion on the different sides of the issue. So thank you. <laughs> Yep, thank you, Dr. Lesher. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Um, you know, and particularly when it comes to um, spots in particular, right? Because you know, as as you pointed out, right, that you know, for each new spots, they're coming up with a new list of projects, and um, unless for some reason there was just a shortfall and they weren't able to afford something from a previous spots, um, they're all going to be new things, right? So. Um, although from a voter's perspective, or I guess a taxpayer's perspective, you could sort of think of about it as continuing the same 1% tax or half percent or whatever it is in a particular case. Um, you know, uh, um, the reality is that it is a separate tax for a different period is just not going to overlap with the previous one. Right. Um, and, you know, as, uh, Dr. Hall pointed out, right, there's other types of local option sales tax as well, um, uh, Bibb County, for example, recently had a uh, vote on a uh, uh, local option sales tax to reduce the uh, um, uh, property tax, um, which is also one that's been used in a few counties. Um, there's a bit of debate about whether or not that actually is beneficial to counties or not, depending on who's actually paying the taxes in those counties, sales tax versus property tax. Um, also, do renters benefit from um, you know, a property tax cut? Um, well, it would depend on what sort of property tax cut it's going to be. Is it going to be a property tax cut about across the board, or is it just going to be for homeowners? Is it just going to help Homestead, um, you know, extend the Homestead exemption? Well, no, then, you know, then renters are going to end up paying actually probably more tax um, uh, as a result um, because they're not going to benefit from the, at least uh, from the Homestead exemption, right? So, um, so these are things to be aware of, um, not necessarily on the on the Houston County or some of the other spots that may be out there. Um, there's been, as Dr. Hall also mentioned, there's been some discussion of a new of new T spots. Um, you know, I don't think Houston County is on board with one at the moment, but um, maybe after this uh, one, the uh, the upcoming spots is resolved, maybe there'll be some discussion of reviving that as well, um, since there are certainly some transportation needs that. Uh, aren't going to be met by this um, SPLOST. Um, uh, let's see. So um, so we have reached basically um, 6.34. So that's more or less the end of our meeting. But I did want to talk about a couple of things very briefly before we uh, um, adjourn. First, I'd like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Caverly and Dr. Hall, uh, and also Dr. Lester for uh, uh, joining us as well and speaking. And um, also wanted to uh, let you know that a recording of this event will be available on our departmental news uh, or departmental YouTube page, um, which is just YouTube YouTube.com slash at sign uh, MGA Paul Psy. Um, they're also links to that on our Facebook and Twitter pages or whatever Twitter is calling itself this week. Um, I also did want to promote our next upcoming political science event, which is going to be in, uh, I think, uh, three weeks time. Uh, that sounds right. Um, so uh, Dr. Yuri Lavoda, uh, who some of you may know, um, is our Fulbright Scholar in Residence. He's been visiting us from uh, the National U Defense University of Ukraine. Um, and uh, he will be speaking on uh, the endless 20th century. Will the 21st century ever start? Um, this is an event that's part of International Education Week. Um, and is being co-sponsored with our Office of International Programs. Um, that event will be Monday, November 13th at 12.30 p.m., uh, be 12.30 to 1.30 in the Macon Library, so on the Macon campus there. I think it's going to be on the second floor. Uh, there will be refreshments served. Um, 
And uh, we're hoping to be able to record that event as well. I'll have to talk to Dr. Lobota and make sure he's okay with that, but probably he will be. So um, so we will definitely record that. We may be able to live stream it, may not, depending on how our technology is working that day. Um, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us. And uh, thank you all. Hope you have a good evening. If you um, um, can't join us for our next event, hopefully you'll be able to join us for a future event. And uh Maybe join us for some of our classes in the spring if you're not already signed up for one. So um, see you all soon.